So our first speaker is Dr. James Ballou. And he comes to us from the University of Indianapolis. He holds, he has a, a long list of accomplishments and also wears many hats. In wearing those many hats, he's a full professor at the Planet School of Physical Therapy. He also holds his Bachelor of Science in Physical Therapy from Marquette University. He has his Master's of Science in Orthopedic Physical Therapy. And he is, most importantly, the co-author of this textbook, Modalities for, Thera um, for Therapeutic Intervention. So if you didn't bring this textbook today, you missed out on your chance to get an autograph. <laughs> if you already don't have it, I suggest it's a good bedtime read. Go on and get one. Now we're going to welcome him up to give us a presentation. Well, good afternoon, and um, thank you for your attendance, and perhaps more importantly, your interest in therapeutic modalities. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. It's my first trip to Canada. Um, I'd like to thank the Alberta Athletic Therapists Association, MedWest, Mount Royal University for the sponsorship of this. And I definitely would like to thank Dennis and Brita and the rest of the colleagues for their outstanding communication and organization in putting this event on. I can honestly say that this has been one of the most well-organized events that I've participated in. I'd like to talk with you this afternoon about neuromuscular electrical stimulation. I'd like to start by defining that as the use of electrical currents for the purposes of increasing or retarding loss of strength. And I'd like to define this, the primary outcome measure of NMES as muscular force or increase in muscular force or strength. And I'd like to differentiate that from many of the secondary outcome measures that are used that may include things like walking speed, pain, uh, ligament laxity tests, uh, time on crutches, time to treadmill, uh, things, subjective questionnaires. And I'd like to bring your attention to this because oftentimes the, sub, the secondary outcome measures are what's used to interpret the efficacy of NMES when its primary given um, outcome measure is uh, suggested to be strength or force. So the question I'm going to start off with in a brief travel through the recent literature before getting out of the literature so as not to drown you in data and significance levels, et cetera. Who benefits from NMES? Well, I'd like to use this model to present this to you. Recently, a model was created from patients progressing to total knee arthroplasty that attempted to delineate or identify the primary underlying factors that lead to the precipitous loss in strength following the total knee arthroplasty procedure. These, these two intrinsic factors were identified as, I mean, these two factors were identified as one intrinsic at the level of the muscle fiber, that being fiber atrophy and fiber loss, and extrinsic loss or neural factors, primarily due to muscle activation and deficits noted at the motor unit level with the declining ability to activate or recruit motor units. While this model was originally created from patients proceeding or advancing on to total knee arthroplasty, it lends itself extremely well to other populations. So looking at our graph here, immediately post-operatively or post-injury in this case, there's a significant drop or reduction in strength. In the ensuing or initial period, and I'll use this cursor for all the uh, people tuning in, in the first several weeks following injury or surgery, that decline in strength is largely related to recruitment factors and inability to fire motor units, recruit them with the same synchrony that was done, that was capable beforehand. But as time progresses uh, down our x-axis and as we proceed from left to right, we see that as time proceeds, the intrinsic factors become a more significant factor with fiber loss and fiber atrophy. So in some manner, we can say that it is the neural factors that beget or contribute to or lead to the intrinsic factors or loss of fiber size, number, et cetera. Now, when we peruse through the literature and see, it is in this initial few weeks of de strength deficit following surgery or injury where the evidence for NMES is most robust or most strong. If we look at the literature for NMES 
and look at the time sequence for when the NMDS was administered, and we see that it falls outside of approximately a six-week window, then we see that the efficacy for NMDS is dramatically reduced. It's a factor I point out that's oftentimes overlooked in many of the reviews, many of the conclusions that are um, used to decide whether or not to approve, refer for, um, or pay for NMES. So more recently, there's been an increased interest in research of it, the efficacy of NMES, and particularly in specific groups. So we'll talk about some of these systematic reviews in some of these patient uh, populations right here. Throughout the literature, there continues to be problems, largely summarized as conflicting evidence, but substantial variation in all sorts of aspects of study, from study design, patient selection, patient follow-up, and most certainly parameter selection, design, application, administration, down to you know, electrodes, et cetera. Uh, despite these deficiencies, there are still some strong consistencies that allow us to extract some information from the literature to be able to use our clinical, to guide our clinical decision making. So in 2011, a systematic review was published that assessed the use of NMES with rehabilitation versus rehabilitation alone in patients undergoing ligament and meniscal injury. They originally looked at 406 studies, but after administering the inclusion and exclusion criteria, that was whittled down to 19 studies. The outcome measures that the systematic review used to assess efficacy for NMES included quadriceps strength and a slew of what I will call the secondary outcome measurements, including performance tests, the KT-1000 ligament laxity test, um, single limb stance time test, and you know, walking speed and ROM are. So the systematic review looked at those 19 studies and, and, and came up with a finding and suggested that strength was better in the group that received NMES at the six week period, no matter how it was measured, isometrically, by manual muscle test, or isokinetically. And it was reported as the evidence was best for NMES when it was applied within and over that six week period. So the subjects receiving the NMES showed functional improvements beyond the strength in increases in strength. They showed improvements in range of motion, activities of daily living scales, walking velocity, and again, the single limb stance time test. But there were no significant differences between the two groups in parameters that were used to assess efficacy of NMES that included the number of patients using crutches, the number of patients progressing to treadmill, pain, or the KT-1000. And I would suggest or ask you to consider, are those appropriate measures to assess the efficacy of NMES when its primary given purpose is to recruit or activate skeletal muscle for the purposes of increasing or retarding, or retarding loss of strength. So the final conclusion from this systematic review for these pac this patient population or patients with ligament or meniscal injury is that NMES combined with rehabilitation is better than rehabilitation alone up to two months. And I'll point out here that this is where sometimes people argue that if there's no difference at six months or one year or two years, and more commonly one year and two years often assessed, if there's no difference at one and two years, then does that warrant the use of NMES? What we know is that the patients that receive NMES, they reach the markers of functional improvement sooner than patients not receiving NMES. And in quality of life scales, patients receiving the NMES um, score higher on those. In 2011, we also saw a systematic review that assessed the, the efficacy of NMES in patients undergoing ACL reconstruction. 301 studies were initially identified, and that was truncated down to eight randomized controlled trials. The findings from the systematic review suggested that studies reporting increased strength also showed the, few, the, the subjects had the fewest number of sessions and the shorter duration of the rehabilitation period. The patients not demonstrating increase in strength or the inconclusive studies, patients were all self-treated and they all used battery powered devices. Two very contentious um, considerations in the use of NMES. The conclusion of this systematic review for patients undergoing ACL reconstruction is that best evidence suggests four weeks of clinically supervised NMES along with rehab. 
two of the eight studies, that's the two slash eight, two of the eight studies reviewed suggested that NMES was not necessary for successful, successful rehabilitation of the ACL reconstruction, but the effect sizes of all studies clearly suggested that NMES with exercise is warranted. Now in 2010, a very damaging, a very damning Cochrane review came out that looked at the use of NMES in patients that had received total knee arthroplasty. The problems with this review are, are very straightforward. They only included randomized controlled trials and controlled clinical trials. They came up with two studies that they then based their entire summation and, and their, their summation on. These two studies, you know, while they had, had their differences, their poor description of parameters, they used patients with end stage OA, the ones most likely to proceed to the um, arthroplasty, and the conclusion from this Cochrane review that was picked up by the media and perpetuated throughout the United States was that there is insufficient data to recommend for or against the use of NMES for quadriceps strengthening in these patients undergoing total knee arthroplasty. Now, which side of that suggestion do you think the third party reimbursers or the insurance companies picked up on? A, a unilateral myopic view. So I say that's why I proceeded this by saying this was a very damaging or very damning um, Cochrane review. However, there was rebuttal to this. Since 2010, there have been four randomized controlled trials that looked at the use of NMES in patients undergoing total knee arthroplasty. NMES on post-operative strength and function in patients undergoing the total knee arthroplasty, two out of those four studies suggested NMES has a significant advantage over no NMES for increasing performance including strength and a variety of the secondary outcome measures that are more related to strength than are not, such as pain or ligament laxity. One of the four studies reported that NMES fails to increase performance better than progressive resistive exercises alone, but the assumption there was that the patients were able to complete the progressive resistive exercises, and if they weren't able to complete the progressive resistive exercises, they weren't included in the study. I'll come back to why that's significant and why who NMES is targeted to help. One of the four studies was designed as a non-inferiority study. A non-inferiority study is basically designed to suggest that there's not, it's not a statistical difference between the two that one's better or not. It's that there's really one, that there's, one is not inferior in the outcomes. Although there are inconsistencies in these four studies between sample size, how or when the NMES was used, and the outcomes measured, there were still several takeaway points. So the takeaway points from these four randomized controlled trials that were in follow-up or in somewhat rebuttal to that initial Cochrane review that used two studies, two of the four studies suggested, the two, I'm sorry, two of the four studies that showed positive benefit, NMES was initiated, initiated on the second post-operative day. One of the four studies showing no benefit, was not, NMES was not initiated until the fourth week post-operatively. So the difference between NMES and the no NMES groups seemed to be most marked in the one to two week, after, at one to two months between those that received NMES and those that did not. So these four reviews collectively supports the assertion that NMES is most helpful when the activation deficits are the most pronounced. And that goes back to those neural factors. When the patient is unable to volitionally activate motor units, NMES has an advantage. The, and conversely, the benefits of NMES decrease almost exponentially if it's delayed or if we wait until the, patient, the, the deficits are considered persistent. And it's very common in my area of the United States to not see a clinician, I mean, sorry, see a physician refer a patient for NMES until they've already been at their six week post-operative checkup and are showing quad deactivation, um, uh, an extensor lag or any any sort, however it's described. At that point, we're well beyond, we're, we're, we're kind of at that optimal window and beyond four weeks for the, the most pre premium optimal window for the use of NMES. Okay. Now here's an area of NMES that a lot of people are not familiar with. A 2013 Cochrane review looked at the use of NMES in patients with advanced disease. 
There were 11 clinical trials used here, and the, the, the comparison was NMES versus no exercise or placebo NMES in patients with COPD, chronic heart failure, or thoracic cancer. The NMES was shown to improve quadriceps strength, the six-minute walk test, and incremental and endurance shuttle walk tests. And the suggestions, uh, the conclusion of this Cochrane view suggested that NMES appears as effective means for improving muscle strength in patients, adult patients coming from these chronically ill patients. And it seems to be due to, a, um, as a result of addressing the underlying loss in strength that is that coexists with these pathologies. So to summarize the literature, the, the recent literature on NMES, when used properly, there's more benefit, I mean, there's more evidence to support the use of NMES than there is to refute it. But the people that want to refute it will latch on to a few poorly constructed conclusions from poorly constructed studies. NMES should be used early, an optimal window of one to four weeks, maybe reaching out to one to six weeks. In this period when recruitment is the primary limiting factor, and it appears also that NMES may offer subjective and objective benefits sooner by perhaps some of those secondary mechanisms. So a patient becoming ambulatory sooner or not requiring crutches or maybe being able to advance to a treadmill if that's the case. These are some of the, the data that suggest patients receiving NMES improve their quality of life sooner than, than populations not receiving NMES, despite the fact that at one in two years, there does not to be one in two years post injury or post-operatively, post there's not substantial evidence to suggest that NMES was better than, not, than no NMES that far out. It's in the more subacute time. All right, so we have evidence for why we should use NMES. Let's look at some of the recent considerations and evidence for why NMES works. So this will kind of start on a foundation that I'm assuming and, and confident that you're familiar with, but we'll put some new understanding to it. So let's consider volitional strength training first. We know that with volitional strength training, there's a time course to the adaptations in strength, such that in the initial, such that in the initial six week period, we see relatively rapid improvements in strength, which then tend to decline um, thereafter. We know that these fa the underlying factors here are both neural and intrinsic, uh, intrinsic or peripheral from hypertrophy, but we know that that hypertrophic response is delayed. And so it's clearly known that it is the underlying neural adaptations that occur within that six weeks that results in this that results in the significant and rapid increase in strength. These, this rapid six-week increase in strength is largely mediated by changes in motor unit recruitment. We see increase in the frequency, size, numbers of motor units recruited, and we see a synchronization of motor units. Now, not ironically, but let's say NMES also does all four of those things when applied to skeletal muscle. Now from a practical basis, NMES should be considered um, an applied stimulus. It's an applied training stimulus used to offer a an appropriate training dose to a patient that lacks sufficient, sufficient volitional activation. NMES engages the neurophysiologic mechanisms, both intrinsic and extrinsic, that lead to an increase in strength. And I emphasize it is when the patient cannot do this. When the patient can do this, the efficacy for NMES is greatly reduced and is essentially not warranted. But it is that period, and again in that window of roughly four to six weeks, when the activation deficits are precipitating the intrinsic or peripheral changes at the level of the skeletal muscle that NMES is most warranted. So I lived in Louisiana in the United States for a long time and there's a, a reference to the holy trinity of um, Cajun cooking, onion, bell pepper, and celery. So I kind of adopted this um, theory to electrical stimulation and I call it the holy trinity of electrotherapy. And this is the way I teach this. If you know the holy trinity of electrotherapy, and you understand some numbers, some parameter numbers to go with, some numbers to go with these three parameter, parameters, you are 
going to be a lot more successful than a lot of people that don't know the Holy Trinity. So let me offer some evidence for selections here because there's always discussion about these parameters. What's best? And I'll keep this really straightforward. Frequency. We know clearly that there is a force frequency relationship. And that between 50 and 80 hertz or 50 and 80 pulses per second or whatever parameter you want, and I won't split hairs with it right now, but whatever parameter you like between 50 and 80 seems to be peak for listening force and skeletal muscle. Beyond 80, there's not, there's not an appreciable increase in force to warrant the sooner fatigue that will be induced by the higher frequency. And below, below the 50 hertz or 50 pulses per second, we do not optimally contract that skeletal muscle for the purposes of strength training or developing strength. Pulse duration. We know now from a lot of studies, some of my own in the last few years, that the longer the pulse duration, the more force we can elicit. Now keep in mind that this holy trinity is kind of like the Olympic circles as well. They're kind of all intertwined. You adjust one, you adjust another, and you get different effects. The longer duration of a pulse or a phase duration elicits greater force. It's been shown in a lot of studies recently. Typically, typically on a neuromuscular electrical stimulator, we'll see pulse duration ranges available between 200 and 1,000 microseconds. And I'm not familiar with every device that you have in Canada, but I know you, I saw, took a tour of the facilities. I saw several uh, Chattanooga units um, from Tennessee in the United States. I'm very familiar with those. So I know those run in that range. For comparison, Russian, which probably everyone and their mother is familiar with, has a cycle duration, or if I can refer to it as a pulse duration so that we're talking apples and apples. Russian uses a 400 microsecond duration. FYI, or for your information or comparison, high volt pulsed current is 100 microseconds, which is one of the reasons when I get questions and people are using high volt for NMES, I talk them out of it quickly because it's only 100 microseconds. And so what do you need to do if you've got 100 microseconds? It's very, very short. What do you have to do in order to get a, a, a better contraction? Yeah, so you've got to crank up the amplitude generally. And then what do you think the patient tolerance is with that? <laughs> right, so the, the laughter in the crowd, right. So that's not going to lead to good efficacy. So despite the fact that high volt can elicit a muscle contraction, doesn't mean it's good for it. I can eat Big Macs every day but it's not good for me. I'll, I'll come back or I'll, call, I'll follow but I'll come back. No, I'm not leaving, but I'll, I'll get to it later that I'll show you some data from our studies recently when we've used a thousand microseconds and what we've done with that. So that's extremely long. That's eternity. That's a millisecond in the electrophysiology of milliseconds eternity. But the bottom line on this graphic here, as you can see, if we start widening out the pulse duration, essentially what happens is that's greater energy. So if you see that each one of those pulses maintains the same amplitude, if we increase the pulse duration of it, we're delivering more energy to that patient with each phase or each pulse. More energy, more force of a contraction up to a point. So here's this up to a point thing. Intensity or amplitude. Force is proportional to an intensity. It's up until that point where you've depolarized all the, or recruited all the recruitable motor units within that region of the electrical field. Once you've recruited them all, that's your peak force. This relies on the overload principle, which we know underlies adaptation. We must overload the capacity of the skeletal muscle in order to elicit adaptation. So as intense as able, I'm going to answer how intense in a moment. If you put an MES on a patient and you get a weak, wormy, squirmy contraction, and they're begging out, tapping out, saying that's enough, your NMES is not likely to be effective. Now that may be the case, so that, may, that situation may be in the first, first initial exposure, may we need to work with that patient to convince them, educate them why, we need, why they need a higher intensity to get a better contraction. But if all you can get is a wormy, squirmy contraction, ask yourself if you would get stronger doing that when you go to the gym. It's just not a proper stimulus. It will not overload. All right, so how much amplitude is enough? I like to refer to it like I do in pharmaceuticals or pharmacology. We need to refer to it as a dosage. We talk about dosage in other areas, laser, diathermy, ultrasound, 
We don't really talk about dosage in NMES. So this has been something that I've been um, campaigning, I guess, um, about. We need to quantify what is the dosage that we use. Um, I know I can only speak for my countrymen and their poor lack of documentation, but I'll go to pick up a patient's chart and they'll say, NMES, 20 minutes. Was that just one contraction for 20 minutes or, <laughs> or what? So I'm not really sure what that means and I'm willing to bet money on the table that they use the default settings on the machine. So I probably have a good chance of repeating what they did just by not pushing any other button. All right, so training intensity, dosage. How do we, how do we address this? Um, I'm gonna recommend a lot of us that are um, experienced, which means older, we've made our mistakes already. Um, we're, we're, a lot of us are suggesting use a training intensity of 70% of the uninvolved side, but we'll see some other studies, I'd like to say several, but few actually document their dosage this way. We're gonna look at some using 40 or 60%. That's 40 or 60% or 70% of the maximal voluntary isometric force of the uninvolved side. We have to assume that there is an uninvolved side, but I am for sake of today's discussion. So the method to do this is really straightforward. You measure the maximal voluntary isometric force on the uninvolved side. Do it however you like. Sit a person down in a, dev in a device uh, such as on the screen. Determine what their max is on the uninvolved side. Then um, set up the patient for the appropriate neuromuscular electrical stimulation using the parameters and waveforms of your choice that I'm going to tell you what to use later. And turn up the intensity until you get a specific target of force for that involved side. A few weeks later, a week later, two weeks later, retest. This is really no difference, no different than in uh, traditional design of strength training programs or when uh, identifying appropriate heart rates or VO2 levels, target levels uh, in a cardiorespiratory program. So this is how I do it. I shot this video in the clinic um, on the way, you know, last week before I came. Here is um, a friend of mine that's supposed to move. And he, there we there we go. All right, so he's going to take his right uninvolved side. I've just got him on a weight stack over there, real simple. I could get fancy with a Cancom, Lido, or Biodex, but this works really well because I can just bend over real quickly and keep sticking a new weight in. You know, it doesn't matter to me that that's 10 pounds at a time. But I keep going, I keep going, and I get to a weight, and I say, okay, go. And that's so I go back and say, okay, we're near as one, we're near as one RM. So for sake of mathematics. You don't need to pull your phones out for it. And my students pull out calculator on the phone all the time when I have them do 10 times 10. I'm sure you guys have got that. But uh, <laughs> I just pick on my students because they pick on me. Right. So now I've instrumented this, this, my subject here. I've got the device. I've got my neurostimulator. And I'm going to turn this up. I've set that weight stack now at, say, 70 pounds because his max was 100 on the other side. And what I do is I turn that up just until... We we'll come back down. So we'll assume that his max on the uninvolved side was 100 pounds. I want him to train at 70% of that. So I pin in the weight at 70 pounds. If I explain that well enough, okay? All right, so far. All right, set him up. I've got my electrodes placed, whatever. And then I, I, I've selected my waveform. I turn it up. I get to the amplitude that just causes that weight stack to move. And you see the little yellow pin over there? And now that is what I will refer to as my dosage. So I know the parameters. I've got a waveform to document, a pulse duration, I've got a frequency, and I just cranked up the big wheel, I call it, on the, the amplitude dial, and I record an amplitude of 65 milliamps, whatever it might have been for that particular patient. Kind of, you know, letting that one roll. That's my dosage for that session. That's my dosage probably for that week. I'm going to retest the following week or the week after and determine Again, his MVIF on the other side probably probably won't change a whole lot, but now I can adjust um, I can adjust my intensity if I if I so choose. Did I explain that well enough? It's a very simple technique, and it only takes a few minutes. And if you can in your clinic, you can treat them right on that same device as long as it's not one you know a popular device and another patient or client needs it. Very simple, very quantitative, very repeatable. Everybody in here could repeat that if I documented that for that session. Okay, let's talk about waveforms. The thing that people always ask me about. I get two or three emails a week. What about this? What about that? Right. So when you have a multi-waveform generator like this Vector Genesis, 
it can be overwhelming. When you whittle this down and you look at it and you suggest that there's probably, oh, I don't know, three, four waveforms on there that you could use for muscle contraction. Let's take a look at it. All right, got to start with the king, right? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to knock the king down a little bit. Uh, everybody's heard of Russian current, I assume. And if you've taken modalities, you've heard of Russian current. It's burst modulated alternating current. That's all it is, BMAC, burst modulated alternating current. Um, let's have a little fun here for a moment. I can't assume, but I'd like to, everybody knows why it got its Russian name, but I want to tie it in to several other countries. It was named Russian because a, a Russian exercise physiology named Dr. Yakov Kotz created, so to say, this characteristic waveform of alternating current. It received its international recognition in what is considered its debut right here in your country, the 1976 Montreal Olympics, Summer Olympics. Ironically, does anybody know who won the men's decathlon that year? Bruce Jenner. Bruce Jenner. What's Bruce Jenner doing these days? <laughs> Russian current stuck around for decades. It was the go-to form. Many, many devices were sold with Russian current until Professor Alex Ward at the University of Latrobe in Australia began to question Russian current, saying, well, it's good, it's fine, but is there better? What, is, is, can we find something that's better than that? So he started playing around with another form of burst modulated alternating current, found that it was better, so I now refer to it as better Russian, and I'll give you some data and evidence on it. He created this waveform that was picked up by a company in Brazil who is the sole manufacturer of what is now known as Alsi current. We have Russian current, now we have Alsi current. So it was in Brazil that Dr. Draper and I had the opportunity to meet and do some teaching down there along with Professor Ward. And so now here in 2015, Dave and I are in Canada, and so I just like to suggest it's a small world, but Canada, you guys have played a big part in the world of NMES. <laughs> <laughs> so keep it up. <laughs> Dennis, you're off to a good start with him. So I don't want to go too far with Russian current, but I want to point out its defining characteristics. It's burst modulated alternating current, sinusoidal shape. As it the, the, this is this is a fast food Russian current, conventional. This is the branded name. You can vary it a little bit, but the Yakov Kotz version is a 2500 hertz carrier frequency bursted at 50 bursts per second. That's the frequency. That's the frequency that your motor, neuro, motor nerve sees, 50. It's so right within that force frequency range. This is why Russian current works. As a cycle duration, or if you will consider a pulse duration, I won't split hairs, but it's an alternating current, not pulsed. But it has a duration of 400 microseconds, which is very sufficient for skeletal muscle or motor nerves. And it has this 10 burst second, 10, I mean, 10 millisecond burst interval with a 10 millisecond interburst interval. So 10 milliseconds on, 10 off. It's referred to as sometimes as a Russian duty cycle or a relative duty cycle. But the way I explain it is, when Russian current is on, it's on 50% of the time. So these are the three, three of the defining characteristics of why Russian current has worked for decades, while, it's, while it still works, but I'm gonna show you some better options. Now, another waveform, very, very common, symmetrical biphasic square. That's its shape. Anybody that's ever played with an Etch-a-Sketch as a kid, you can make these waveforms. My daughter's four. She's making waveforms. <laughs> We're going to name it something. I haven't figured it out yet. But All right, Symmetrical biphasic square. This is the most, common, most commonly used waveform on handheld stimulators for years. Still very, very common, handheld stimulators. Pulse duration, and the manufacturers usually make this between two and 600. Sometimes they just average it out and make a fixed duration of 400 microseconds. And it typically has a frequency range between 30 and 80. So you can clearly get within your 50 to 80 peak range for strength. There's two reasons this waveform works. I'm not saying it's bad. It's a two reasons it works for NMES. Because of its rectangular square shape, it has a relatively instantaneous rate of rise. 
And when it is on, it is on at peak amplitude the entire time. So what this means is for the area under the curve, that slightly, I don't know if you want to call it darker, Mount Royal blue color, uh, maybe I hope I'm close to being, uh, but the color inside the square, because that is instantaneous rise and it stays at that peak the entire time, the area inside that phase is greater than if it were ramped up and down. And I want you to hold that thought in mind when we start talking about areas, areas within the curve and what that means. And that parameter is phase charge, phase charge. Now, Chattanooga Company out of the United States took this symmetrical biphasic waveform back in the 80s. And based on some evidence that of using what's called an interphase, interphase or intrapulse interval they noted from paper from bowman and baker that they can get the same force output at 10 percent less amplitude that was the initial impetus for this interphase interval and so this is what the proprietary vms waveform is so if you watch antiques roadshow you might see a vms stimulator unit um, or if you go into your intellects, the vector genesis, a sub button under your electro, electrical stimulation button usually have, oftentimes will have VMS. That's what this is. Right. More recently, this idea of the use of the interphase interval was substantiated by Laufer when I believe she I have to looked at this and used a variety of different interphase intervals and noted that on the far right of that screen, interphase intervals of 150, 250 microseconds versus no interphase interval or 10, 50, the higher interphase intervals elicited greater muscle force than the use of lesser or no interphase intervals. So you don't have, the devices that I've seen here, you don't have an option for changing that interphase interval, but it substantiates the use of a VMS waveform, not that I'm advertising for Chattanooga, but it is a waveform that offers you that interphase interval, which the strict symmetrical biphasic does not. So VMS was pretty good. So they came along with a new waveform, relative, not relatively new anymore, I've said that long enough that I can't say that anymore a waveform called VMS burst. I refer to this, it's burst modulated biphasic pulse current. What this is, this is a combo meal. This is a hybrid. This is combining the, 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 the bursting of Russian and the shape and the interphase interval that we see with VMS. So it's taking key features of two things and combining them. I'm not, I, I don't know if the, the intellect in the lab has this. I'm not, I use the Genesis a lot more. But if you have this VMS burst, what it is, is it's three symmetrical biphasic pulses elicited together in a burst. It uses a fixed, meaning unchangeable, fixed interphase interval of 100 microseconds, which is the proprietary creation of Chattanooga and it bursts it at a frequency that you set it at. So conventional Russian uses a burst frequency of 50. If you so choose, you can use 50, 60, 70, 80. If your purposes are for increasing strength, shoot between 50 and 80. You set it. It has a variable pulse duration. You actually on the Ch Chattanooga units end up setting phase duration. So you have to be a little careful. If you set 400 microsecond phase duration, you've got to double that for the biphasic pulse. So it's, you can you can select a longer phase duration, a longer phase duration, which the evidence supports. And I'm going to continue to show you some evidence for these waveforms. So that then kind of leads to this ALSI current which I refer to as better Russian. 
or burst modulated alternating current. Well, that's also what Russian is, but this is mo I call modified Russian as well. Uh, I'm not sure that this is available in Canada yet. They recently came into the United States about a year and a half ago and starting to make some impact there. Here's what all current is. Keep in mind what Russian is, but I've also given you kind of the contrasting data. Alsi current uses a one, one kilohertz or a 1,000 hertz AC carrier frequency, which is different than Russian, which was 2,500. It uses, Alsi current uses a two millisecond burst duration, sometimes even four, but characteristically two, in contrast to the 10 millisecond burst duration of Russian. And Alsi uses a 10% duty cycle versus the 50% of Russian. So I'll point it out here, and I'm going to elucidate on this later. The 2,500 hertz carrier frequency of Russian, the frequency, that yields the 400 microsecond cycle duration. One cycle of, of AC, 400 microseconds for Russian. With ALSI having a 1,000 hertz carrier frequency, the inverse of that, 1 over 1,000, is 1,000 microseconds. So decreasing the frequency elongates that sine wave, and it's going to result in, I'm going to show you, it's going to result in greater force. So those are all waveforms that are, pro with the exception of ALSI for a while until it comes to Canada, that you have at your disposal. So I give you this information for clinical decision making. What are you going to choose and what's best? All right, so which one? Let's look at Russian and Aussie. So Alex Ward, several papers by Alex Ward. If you look his name up, some very excellent papers. He looked at muscle force production or torque. He looked at torque and using a variety of different um, carrier frequencies and duty cycles. And he showed that in the blue arrow at the top, a one kilohertz or 1,000 hertz carrier frequency yielded significantly greater muscle force than the 2.5 kilohertz or the 20, I'm sorry, yeah, 2.5 kilohertz, 2,500 hertz duty cycle. And that at the blue arrow there is a it represents a 10 or combined, they come up 10 or 12 and a half percent duty cycle that yielded significantly greater force than the 50% duty cycle of Russian. And this is, again, with a lesser carrier frequency, lesser burst duration, and a lesser duty cycle. So what about this concept of the effect on shape? I told you about the etch sketch and I'm assuming that's a universal toy, correct? All right, thank you. Um, anymore, I don't assume a whole lot. But the, uh, you play with etch a sketch and you start playing around. If you ever took, you know, you know, took geometry and trig and everything and painfully remember that, you can easily remember areas under the curve. Well, I went back and looked at some engineering data and some studies, and it, and it was a really nice paper back from 1980 from Bankoff, who looked at the different shapes, and he looked at an alternating waveform. Now, if you consider the X and Y variables, you got etch a sketch with you, right? Going X and Y, going left and right. So if you made a sine wave like that, and then you superimposed over it a square, or a rectangle for that matter, just to, that has the same duration and the same amplitude, it will look something like that, and now consider area under the curve. So for the same X and Y, the same duration and the same amplitude, looks the same on paper. I've got the same duration, I've got the same amplitude, but the shape now makes a, a, a big impact. There's one third, approximately one third greater charge in that square or rectangular form over the sinusoidal form. If I can deliver one third more stimulus to the patient, it makes sense that we get a greater elicitation of force. So this concept of greater torque with greater phase charge was substantiated by Wayne Scott in the United States, looking at a variety of phase charges. So making the area under the curve greater, and getting more force. So in 2012, we published a paper that looked at it this way. We said, okay, Russian's good. What about this hybrid thing, that burst modulated biphasic pulsed current? the one that was kind of a hybrid of VMS and Russian. So we said, okay, let's keep, the, let's keep the parameters that are common the same. 
So we use the same frequency, the same phase duration, and we use the same amplitude. Let's see how much force we get at 100 milliamps. But the dissimilarities were right here, and particularly right over there. We use a lesser carrier frequency, a lesser burst duration, a lesser duty cycle, and the key thing is we had that rectangular shape as opposed to sinusoidal. So we turn them up to 100 milliamps, record force, and what do we find? That that burst modulated current yielded 63% of their maximal voluntary force, the Russian elicited only 36%. If that's a training stimulus, or you go to the gym to work out, and you use 63 pounds or 36 pounds, you know which one's gonna make you stronger, sooner, better, faster, quicker, smarter, right? That's the, that's the evidence behind why we choose certain waveforms over another, is we get a greater training stimulus. So then combining some of this evidence, when we look at Ward's papers and studies that suggest that lesser carrier frequency, lesser burst duration, et cetera, yields greater force, we we'll look at our work, we we'll look at Bankoff suggesting that shape makes a difference, and we we'll look at Sc Wayne Scott's work that suggests phase charge is important. We came along then and more recently looked at a, something rather simplistic. We just took one of the Chattanooga units and said, okay, let's just simply change the phase duration. By doing so, we can effectively change the phase charge. So we set a 400 microsecond phase duration and we used a 120 microsecond phase duration. And the reason we picked that is because we couldn't precisely get what we wanted to make a 2500 hertz carrier frequency, just was a limitation of the parameters available to us. But we tried to approximate it to get to 2500 hertz. So we had a, we had a, long, we had a longer pulse duration that was due to a lesser carrier frequency, much like Ward looked at. And we looked at a higher carrier frequency, which meant that the sine waves were coming more frequently, which meant that the phase duration was shorter. And so what did we find here? We found what I sometimes refer to as the white whale. We found near 100% elicitation, 100% of the maximal voluntary force with the use of that burst modulated biphasic pulse current using a lesser carrier frequency versus 40% of the maximal voluntary isometric force. And I contrast this into a sort of a global survey of the data on NMES, and typically studies using NMES are eliciting forces in the range of 30 to 60% of the maximal voluntary isometric. So to be able to train at near 100% or peak has been somewhat elusive to this point. And so we've been doing this, and we've got plenty of other people collecting data and seeing the same thing simply using a proprietary waveform that that's available to many people just by modifying, go, go in, the edit, in the edit button. The edit button is your friend, I teach everybody. So wrapping this up, where are we now? Evidence for NMES is robust. It's probably as robust as it ever has been. New evidence for waveform parameters, waveform shape, uh, selection of these, it continues. We're getting more and more new data out all the time. With that, however, quality training studies are relatively sparse. We have some decent ones from select populations. We have these newer ones from the patients with advanced disease, or there's still a, a relatively um, relative sparsity of, of, of quality training studies. And another limiting factor that we were talking about since we've arrived is this bias against electrophysical <laughs> agents, which seems to be sort of the um, uh, precedent for how we got to this, this the idea of this conference in the first place, and that if there's a bias against electrophysical agents, this may limit its use and therefore limit its, its uh, extendability out to the patients that need it. So what conclusions can we say? Neuromuscular electrical stimulation is a tool. It needs to be used selectively, not randomly. It needs to be used on patients who, who have appropriately been identified as having difficulty with volitional recruitment. And it needs to be used within a suitable time frame. So if you have to campaign, recruit, or advertise, or whatever you need to do to convince, in our case, referral sources, to be able to get those patients or advise the physician on how to recognize a patient that needs it, so be it. But get those patients on it sooner. We now know, too, that the that benefit of NMES seems to exist ex or extend beyond the athlete largely coming from the studies coming from those patients with advanced disease. And right now, we probably have the best evidence ever 
to support the selections of parameters and waveforms. So I encourage you to use it. I'm going to wrap up there with, again, a final thanks to our sponsors, and I'll be happy to entertain questions now or later, whichever it may come, and, and after the sessions as well. Thank you very much for your time. To just stay aware of the time, uh, we have five minutes to entertain questions. Mark's going to facilitate this, and I'll get the next speaker ready. So I'll hand it over to Mark. All right. Sure, so thank you very much. That was great. And uh, I don't. I know we have a lot of alumni here, and I'm wondering if I've taught anybody outside of Larry uh, back in the '90s. Because one of the things that I and, and so while you're thinking about your questions. <laughs> One of the things that I noticed, and, and I was I, I told you the story earlier, but I went on sabbatical a couple of years ago when I came back, and when I came back, I was preparing to teach the modalities course again. I looked for new and great things, and so his work is some of the new and great stuff that I think I've uh, uh, discovered as I was doing research. Um, and one of the things that I taught back in the 90s was that waveform didn't matter. So if you go back to the Nelson and Courier books back in the 90s, um, they'll say that waveform didn't matter, and I think it's a really, and, and so I don't know if I've taught that to anybody at any point, but I want to take it back. <laughs> <laughs> I know I didn't teach it last year for the folks that were in, in, in the program because I've been using his new, new research, but waveform does matter, and I think that's one of the key messages in your story today. Um, so I will, I'll stop talking. Any questions <laughs> from the audience uh, that are here, and uh, I'll go online. So people that are online, feel free to take your questions in if you have any. Yeah, Tim. Sorry, I made a comment about a battery powered NMES versus you know one that's connected to modality. Is there a difference clinically if you use the handheld versus the? Yes. Should I repeat the question? Yes. yes, please. So I made a comment earlier that one of the limitations in studies is the use of battery-powered devices. And until a few years ago, and I'm, I do not work for any company, until a few years ago, handheld devices had been shown to be inferior, specifically in the listening force, compared to line-powered plug-in units. Then it came along the empty unit called the 300 PV. And it's 300 PV. Don't write it down because it doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> no, no, but, oh, but wait, I, 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 Fitzgerald and all, I can't recall the year, Fitzgerald and all, I believe it was, is the one who put out the paper that showed that for the first time ever, uh, a handheld unit was comparable to, not, not different, than the line-powered units. Now, that uses a symmetrical biphasic square. Off the top of my head, I don't remember what it was that they used as their waveform for the plug-in unit, but the guts, if you will, of the 300 PV are now part of the MP continuum. I do not work for them. I'm not advertising. I'm telling you what's available to you. So the, the, the 300, the continuum is now has the guts of the 300 PV. And I can't say so confidently that the MP Phoenix, which is a garment wrapped embedded electrode handheld battery powered unit, uh, if that has the same guts or not. Excellent question. Yeah, so uh, on that note, one of the reasons why we brought the machines here today is we, based on, on the research that I've done, we've been buying new machines for teaching students. And so, uh, and that was one of my questions was, you have no bias towards Chattanooga. It just so happens that they're the ones that create right. the BMS and the BMS Burst right. that, you, that you advocate for and the ones that you're doing research on. I, I'm not paid by any of them. I okay. just use what's there. Um, we, I have a... a Fred is a biomedical engineer. Radio Shack is one of our favorite stores. We go and we make things. He makes things. And I shop people with him. Um, or, he, <laughs> or he takes apart a vectrogenesis, uh, or takes apart a device and allows us to manipulate the variables because we don't, I, I don't exist in a, in a major research institution that, that pays us to do that per se. But sometimes we, we um, create our own stimulators to see what the effect would be. And then we say, well, what's the closest thing to this on the market? So years ago, when I started identifying this VMS burst, I said, well, that sounds very pretty similar to what this biomedical engineer of mine was doing. Let's try it out. Perfect. And Larry, which units have it and which ones don't? Yeah. For those of you, before you go any further, that's Larry Mack, I'm sure. Larry. <laughs> 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 
Larry uh, is the uh, primary director with NetVest. But Larry, what, what are the units that have for the US first? Uh, just currently the uh, intellectual dynamics. The Genesis. Do you, carry the, do you get the Genesis here? Uh, that's the comparison to the US. OK, OK. So good. So knowledge for me to take home. Good. So um, I, I want to just emphasize it, that these are things that in the clinic we just started asking, and, and Alex Ward you know, was one of those guys that were kind of on the, the same wavelength. We just started thinking, always asking, so what is there better? Is there better? And until we find perfect, which we never will, we keep asking better. So it's, it's just use clinical inquiry uh, to, 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 to feed your research. Other questions? Yeah. You said uh, NMBS is only indicated for people that have neural deficits post-surgery. Quickly, how do we test the neural difference between neural deficit and just the structural deficit or muscle fiber? Okay, so I suggested that it's more indicated. I want to retract the word only, but uh, the next guys yeah. don't like those extremes. More indicated for patients with neural deficit. And what I mean by that is recruitment issues. And so clinically, I'm not going to do EMG on them to determine that. But I might look at you know, for extensive lag, a comparative sign. Are they able to generate a, a, as robust a quadricep contraction as the other side? Are they able to, I don't know, isometric knee extension, whatever may be indicated for that patient and their post-operative or post-injury considerations. If it, if it seems to be recruitment, if it's, if it's acute post-operatively, it's not intrinsic yet. They haven't yet had a, that significant enough atrophy or fiber loss to account for that as much as it would be activation deficits. Did I explain that? Well, yeah. Okay. Thank you for the question. Okay. Maybe along. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Okay. One more. Question. So, <laughs> I have a symmetrical bias basic square waveform from a patient, and I set a one second like ramp for comfort. If I extend that to three seconds, okay. I'm more comfortable. Is that going to change my, my waveform? Like yeah. Sinusoidal waveform. I don't know. Um, because <laughs> because it's, you need you need to pull out the manual and see. And this is why, because we don't know, and the only way you'll know this is to look at the manufacturer. So if you select, um, let's say here, here's your, th here's your three seconds, if that's right, but you also decide to put in a one second ramp, what we don't know, and you have to look at if that one second ramp is part of the three seconds or not. It may be, or it may not be. You have to look at the way. So if it is, I mean, if it's not, then you actually have additional energy delivered to that bank, same as if you do a fall. Uh, and if it is part of it, which a lot of people do, you know, they set, they want a 10 second contraction, but they do a two seconds, you know, rise and fall. That might mean they're really only at peak for 60, 60%, 60 six out of 10 in this case, 60% of the time. And these are considerations that are easily overlooked. But great question. Pull open the manual and see what they got. I'm going to do a follow up to his question, if you don't mind. Um, and then you guys can take a look. Uh, so, you use the time frame of six weeks as that kind of golden time frame that in the first six weeks post surgery or post acute injury that you'll get the best effects with, with uh, muscle stimulation. So further along his question though, what happens if you get somebody that has telephemoral pain and they're not firing their VMO for whatever reason because of the pain we assume? Uh, would you put them into that category, even though they've had had femoral syndrome for a year? Would you put the, if they're not able to fire that muscle appropriately at, and timing wise? Would you still put them into that six week period? So good question. First of all, I'll say the six weeks is really kind of what you know, evidence is telling us. Four weeks may be better. And in the example of the patient with the chronic patellofemoral mechanism dysfunction and maybe pain. I'm looking at that as a slight, that's a, a different scenario because we, that's not post-operatively or post-injury. That's a, a different scenario. We have, we, we're going to have a different mechanism for, for the loss in strength. It may not really be the predominance of neural that we depict from the, 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 the um, sort of um, um, graphic that I was identifying earlier when we get loss of volitional recruitment following the injury or post-operatively when we have, you know, edema, neural inhibition, etc. in this case. So um, in that particular patient, the use of neuromuscular electrical stimulation may become what might be called neuromuscular re-ed, 
So active, active contractions of VMO substances of, uh, assisted by the electrical stimulation and maybe not driving for the peak forces that we're trying to get under what I'll refer to as this straightforward traditional NMES when we're trying to drive stimulus to get the greatest force possible. Did I explain that? Okay, uh, that was a good question though. Good to know that. Maybe just one more question. 